Today we continue talking about interpreting statutes and specifically criminal law statutes. Um, as I mentioned, one purpose of this chapter is to provide you the tools to interpret statutes. Another is to define the constraints on that interpretation. The principle of legality was the first subsection here, and it's a uh, you know constraint on how the statute has to be designed and the limits of how judges can interpret it. They can't add new pieces to the puzzle. They can't add new parts of the statute, but they can reinterpret old statutes. Um, the next constraint is a little uh, broader, but still doesn't apply in that many cases. Uh, these are the, these intro uh, sections are meant to show just the, the sort of fringe doctrines that affect how uh, laws are interpreted. But the simple fact is vagueness is something that is law students often want to identify in statutes, uh, but uh, it is rarely applicable as a doctrine. So one thing to help us understand why this is the case and to generally understand the vagueness doctrine is that we have two basic categories of uh, statutes, right? We could say three if you want to say crystal clear statutes that are absolutely easy to understand with the facts applied and they have a plain meaning. But for the most part, we can say we have vague statutes and we have ambiguous statutes. Now, those words sound very similar. Uh, there are other fields that draw distinctions between them. The philosophy of language is one, but their distinctions are not necessarily what I'm going to draw here in helping to make sense of this doctrine versus the last section of this chapter. At the crudest level, vagueness is bad, and ambiguity, if not good, is okay. It's, it's tolerable. It's something our system allows. If a statute is deemed to be vague, uh, it is unconstitutional under the due process clauses of the Constitution, either in the 4th or 14th Amendment. And you don't have to worry about the specifics of the constitutional structure here. It's just enough to know that due process and sort of this Im implied right to notice that it stems from it uh, means that statutes that are too vague and are associated with certain unjustified consequences, and we'll talk about those after our case, uh, those statutes will be struck down either in their entirety, if it's what we call a facial challenge, meaning it's unconstitutional in all cases, or as applied to this defendant, meaning that it still could be used against other defendants, just not this one. And so we'll, I'll explain facial versus as applied a bit more as we go here. Uh, but these are, that's the basics, right? Those, that's, that's where we start with uh, vagueness. So when we're looking at vague statutes, we do start by looking for some sort of um, grammatical or vocabulary phrasing structure uh, that makes uh, the clarity of the statute unclear. And I'll say it's linguistic clarity is sort of a, a threshold thing we need. And if it's lacking, well, that at least starts our vagueness inquiry. So there's an excerpt at the beginning of the chapter from Professor Carissa Hessick. And, you know, she has written a very good article uh, that's much longer than this, outlining the difficulties with our doctrine, uh, which largely is a product of the last half of the 20th century and the early 21st. Um, and the cases that have been written in by the Supreme Court, I mean, the opinions that have been written by the Supreme Court, are not always the clearest. Um, the, the doctrine is something that uh, scholars have often had to piece together because sometimes the court phrases the test a little different than in others. Uh, but cr the excerpt from uh, uh, Hessek helps to uh, mention a few cases where it was applied and the general ideas uh, that are in, involved in the due process uh, clause and its relation to vagueness. Uh, but, you know, I think one of the, the best parts of, of looking at vagueness, at least from both a, a learning standpoint and an enjoyment standpoint, is to look at some of the older cases in this area. And I'll tell you, uh, Papa Cristo versus City of Jacksonville is uh, my favorite Supreme Court case. Um, not everyone has one, but it is definitely mine. Um, and it's it's because there's so much going on that's really crazy. Um, and it, and Justice Douglas is also a very colorful writer. Now, Justice Douglas is a uh, uh, long-serving justice, our longest-serving justice at the time, and, and uh, he was a... 
he had a very liberal-minded uh, fellow. He also had some very libertarian ideas uh, to the degree, civil libertarian ideas. Uh, he was very concerned with nature. Um, a lot of this can be traced to his background in Washington, and in some of it can even be traced to stories he's told. Um, one of the difficulties we have with Justice Douglas, though, is he was also a notorious liar. Um, many people wonder about, in his biographies, autobiographies, uh, how much is actually true. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I might mention one story of his a bit later to explain why he's so um, perhaps uh, interested in the fate of people prosecuted under the Jacksonville Ordinance. Um, but I, I mention all this because this opinion is written in a way that is probably unusual uh, for you. Maybe not. Depends on how many Supreme Court opinions you've read. It certainly doesn't fit with the style of modern Supreme Court justices. It is not as legalistic. It is not as textual. It is not as focused on specific applications of doctrine. It's very holistic, and it's, as I said, very colorful in language and uh, what Justice Douglas considers relevant. With that being said, it's the majority opinion. So just because he is the author does not mean uh, there are not votes uh, in favor of this opinion. Okay, so what is happening in Papa Christa? Well, that itself is, is sort of a, a crazy story, right? The facts involve um, people prowling by auto, which itself is an odd phrase. What does it mean to prowl by auto? It's also not something that's actually mentioned in uh, the ordinance that's passed by the city of Jacksonville, despite the fact that, that it, it almost mentions everything. Um, at least everyone probably commits a crime there. It seems like an incredible laundry list of uh, activities that the city council just didn't like. Um, and yet prowling by auto is how the particular phrasing for the arrest and prosecution was done in this case. But there's, you know, this is a vagrancy statute. It, it's what it's it's a general label, and that's what the city council called it. And so it's weird. Do you think of vagrants in cars? Well, no. This is um, something very basic and and um, typical, unfortunately, of the time going on here, which is we have interracial couples. And we're now in an era where the Supreme Court said that you can't have prohibitions on interracial marriage in the Loving case. Uh, there is a greater social awareness of, you know, the, the discrimination that has occurred, particularly against African Americans. Nonetheless, there are many police who still want to uh, punish people for uh, this interracial dating or uh, long-term relationships. And so they arrest our defendants here, and they ultimately ultimately are looking for a crime to apply. And even though Prowley by Auto is not listed, if you were looking for a statute to apply broadly and apply to everyone, this would be a place to go. Um, and so let's look at this incredible ordinance. And I, I use incredible here and in, in meaning that it causes disbelief. Um, but I also appreciate it in some ways because I don't think it's a good statute. It's not one I'd ever support, but I, I appreciate almost the, the frank honesty here that the Jacksonville City Health Council had and just including a um, often random seeming list of people and activities that they just just don't want to see anymore and putting it all under the label of vagrancy even though it's hard to say how people become vagrants merely for doing some of these things. Um, so let's look through the ordinance. Um, a bit of stop in places to, to maybe give you some modern interpretations or what is really going on uh, with the language choices used uh, by the city. Rogues and vagabonds are dissolute persons who go begging, common gamblers, persons who use juggling or unlawful games or plays. Now, you, unlawful games you, you might think of as, you know, people playing gambling, dice games, something like that on the street. It's unclear why jugglers uh, are, are caught here, but it might be as they think uh, street performers in general um, are a, a problem and a menace and are vagrants, and that might also be captured in the word plays. Common drunkards. Now, this is actually going to present a problem we get to in our next chapter, which is defining a person's status as opposed to um, their particular conduct, meaning there's a difference between public intoxication than saying somebody is a drunkard. 
we generally want our statutes to define things as it, the conduct of becoming intoxicated or are currently being intoxicated as a crime. Referring to someone as a drunkard might be a permanent state, right? And, and it's something that our law is going to disfavor, but um, it was something that many jurisdictions, particularly cities in the South, um, uh, used in their, their uh, statutes and ordinances during the time. Common night walkers. Now, this, of course, is meant to refer to prostitution. Uh, I think Justice Douglas takes a little colorful liberty with this by trying to be very, very literal with it, right? You know, by saying, oh, walking at night. Um, but it is true that the language here, if you don't realize night walker is meant to be prostitution, at least presents some ambiguity. That doesn't necessarily mean it's vague, but there is at least uh, multiple interpretations possible. Thieves, again, notice it's talking about thieves as a, a status, not as somebody who has stolen the property of another without permission. Pilferers or pickpockets, traitors and so, stolen property, lewd, wanton, and levacious persons, keepers of gambling places, common railers and brawlers, in other words, people who get in fights, persons wandering or strolling around from place to place without any lawful purpose or object. Now, that's really one thing that sets Justice Douglas off. And admittedly, it sounds like anyone who's lost or just literally on a stroll. The lawful purpose is a, or object is a strange way to refer to um, uh, the activity of walking. However, we do see language like without any lawful purpose in modern loitering statutes, which have survived challenges. So we'll, we'll have to think a bit about that. Habitual loafers. Okay, now we're really getting into sort of the personal axe grinding, right? People who are lazy <laughs> and are, become, are criminals under the Jacksonville ordinance here. Disorderly persons. Persons neglecting all lawful business and habitually spending their time by frequenting houses of ill fame, gaming houses, or places where alcoholic beverages are sold or served. Okay, now the first two of those means you go to brothels a lot, you go to illegal gambling halls. But the last one just says going to restaurants regularly, right? You know, even with uh, restrictive alcohol laws in, uh, uh, in Florida at the time, this is a remarkably expansive clause, right? Saying that if you frequent places where alcohol beverages are merely sold or served, even if you don't drink them, right? That is itself part of the criminal conduct defined here. Persons able to work, but habitually living upon the earnings of their wives or minor children shall be deemed vagrants. Now, you have to think this last one was really personal for somebody, right? It, not just because of the weird gender nature here, right? It's talking about husbands or um, uh, parents who uh, are dependent on their wives or more minor children, but should otherwise be employed. I, I just imagine somebody in the city council had like a brother-in-law or somebody they didn't like, and they just wanted to criminalize uh, um, the conduct of depending upon other people. Um, this is a, a hodgepodge, right? It's an incredible classification. And yet, amazingly still, it's not clear where our defendants fit. Um, now, there are many defendants here, and I've, I've reduced the discussion of some of the background facts to make the case a little easier to digest. Um, but, you know, and, and in fact, the majority opinion here is not focused on whether the statute applies. Instead, it's focused on whether or not uh, the statute itself is vague, either in total with all defendants or is applied to these defendants. And Justice Douglas, because he's not as, you know, as I said, focused on the very specific doctrine, the text, it's sometimes hard to pull away from this opinion. Uh, what about the statute um, is, is vague in an unconstitutional sense? And why we couldn't just sever those parts. In other words, eliminate the vague parts and leave the rest. It's, you know, but this isn't as unusual in 1972, um, but it's pretty, pretty out there. Um, and we see Justice Douglas talking a lot about, you know, the, the desire to walk freely and to saunter. In fact, he goes through sort of the etymology and history of sauntering in footnote seven. Um, and this is where I will say there is a story that Justice Douglas liked to tell that really does show his sort of um, you know, opinion of jurisdictions that tried to criminalize the less fortunate, the wanderers in our society. Uh, Justice Douglas attended Whitman uh, in Washington State for his undergrad, but then went to Columbia Law School. And he said at the time he didn't have enough money uh, to cross the United States. And so he hitched a ride on trains with the hobos. Um, and so he, he says he learned a lot and he enjoyed his time with the hobos and he illegally took these trains. And he thinks that's something that's 
part of Americana, right? In other words, the ability to just sort of be free of society strictures and rules. Uh, Justice Douglas hated Washington, D.C. He would often leave uh, early, even while the justices were still working on things, uh, simply because he wanted to go back and go fly fishing in the Northwest. Um, he was, you know, just a, a contentious person. He fired his clerks, did not get along with lots of people. And so he liked the individuality that often represented in some of uh, the things that are criminalized here. So it's, it makes sense that he's writing this opinion, but I also want to you know, give you, you know, maybe some, some background, some context for why he identified so much with the, as he refers to, nonconformist dissenters, idlers, poor people. You know, he, he thinks these are important parts of our um, uh, population that are too easily ignored, um, discarded, and in some cases they are more or less criminalized for being them. With all this being said, one thing we need to think about and one thing we need to talk about in class is what about the statute is really vague? Because this is a foundational case. It's still cited by uh, the Supreme Court. It still helps to define the vagueness doctrine. You know, Douglas does give us a test that I'll talk about a little bit more in our later case cases, but his application of it's just kind of left aside or implied. And so I want to posit for you to challenge that maybe the statute isn't vague at all and there's something else going on here. And then how do we deal with the vagueness doctrine if we don't have vagueness? Well, these are, these are thoughts and we'll, we'll help to work through them. Um, but Papa Christu is, a, as I said, a foundational case, but maybe it's not the best one to follow from a formulaic learning perspective, right? It tells you a lot about context, which is important, right? Because we'll see a lot of statutes during the semester where you might look at it and say, ah, that language just seems really vague to me. But it's that extra context, the just sort of discriminatory, the arbitrary enforcement that often emerges that, that causes the vagueness doctrine to be applied. Because merely um, uh, vague or um, ambiguous language or a lack of linguistic clarity is not sufficient for a statute to be deemed unconstitutional. Uh, so I mentioned the basic test here, and sometimes it's divided into two or three pieces. You can divide it however you want. I'm telling you the parts of it that are absolutely essential. So you need to have, uh, as I said, linguistic confusion from a sort of reasonable lay person's perspective. Uh, the way that it's phrased is uh, it fails to give a person of ordinary intelligence fair notice that the contemplated conduct is forbidden by the statute. So there's some linguistic confusion in the statute itself. But there are these policy considerations that have to also exist. And this is where Justice Douglas's opinion is still very important, right? Because he does get a lot into these policy considerations. He feels the fair warning um, aspect is important here. In other words, not just the linguistic confusion, but the fact that we have to, as a matter of due process, give people at least the opportunity to be warned. They don't have to, in fact, be warned, but the opportunity has to be there so that our statutes don't you know, present just uh, an inability to comply effectively. Just as a hypothetical, we could reduce all our criminal laws to a single sentence. And uh, in some sense, most of us might know how to comply with it most of the time, but the vagueness doctrine would tell us otherwise. So that single sentence would be, don't do bad. That's it. Right? Don't do bad. All criminal law includes things that are bad. Don't do bad. You can see the problems, right? That's the extreme form of a vague statute. Well, what is bad, right? We might all think murder is, but then as we start getting further and further down to, say, juggling, uh, there's suddenly disagreement. There's a lack of fair warning. So our criminal law should at least be defined uh, to the level that a person of ordinary intelligence has fair warning. But perhaps the most important policy element linking in the background, and the one that also is necessary for the due process violation to be found, is this concept of arbitrary and discriminatory enforcement. And I actually divide this into two images here because we can think of arbitrary and discriminatory enforcement being different, and it's not clear from the opinions if you need both, if you need either. I think it's fair to say if, if one of them is, is strong enough, in other words, if you have really arbitrary enforcement or really discriminatory enforcement, that's probably enough of a trigger, but courts often treat them as a collective, but I want to separate them for the moment. Arbitrary enforcement, I, I use a coin flip here, right? In other words, imagine that we have a crime defined uh, that basically includes everyone. So even though speeding is not a crime, we can treat it for one, right? It's considered a violation, but let's say we escalate it and include jail or prison penalties, and people continue to drive as they are. 
Well, most cars are speeding in any given moment. And so if we had some sort of arbitrary uh, enforcement technique, that would potentially be problematic. Now, the speedy laws still wouldn't be unconstitutionally vague because they're actually very precise. There's a speed limit defined quantitatively. But it might be a form of arbitrary enforcement. So arbitrariness is just, you know, sort of willy-nilly. It could be a random technique. But discriminatory enforcement is different. And this is where most of our cases um, end up uh, focused. Uh, discriminatory uh, means that a particular group, a population, uh, is targeted. And it's usually a group that has strong um, or, or a, a significant history of being discriminated against. So ethnic minorities and race are certainly factors here. But a lot of our cases actually emerge among the poor and homeless, right? A population that is targeted a lot uh, by uh, cities that just want to put homeless and poor populations out of sight, right, to drive them away. Uh, business owners often support this because they don't want uh, people just milling about out front, particularly if they're uh, unwashed or they think they, you know, uh, discourage customers from coming in. And so these laws are, are, are a big part of our low-level regulation of uh, populations. They're often uh, very little bit penalty, but those penalties are quite severe to somebody who has no money, right? So even fines of $100 uh, are, are just unthinkable to be paid uh, by a person who has no employment, is mentally ill, and living on the streets. Um, and so in order to find a statute unconstitutionally vague, there have to be all these things, right? A linguistic confusion created, a lack of fair warning to a person of ordinary intelligence, and then some arbitrary and discriminatory enforcement. And then and only then is a statute unconstitutionally vague. And Papa Christ is very important for seeing this sort of arbitrary and discriminatory enforcement, right? The application to these defendants is discriminatory, right? They are focused on interracial couples here. Um, there's also potentially some arbitrariness, say, to who is included in the statute, but it's eh, Justice Douglas doesn't give us as much there. And as I mentioned, arbitrariness is often um, not central to these cases or not even discussed. It's often the discriminatory enforcement that seems more significant. And as I said, a lot of these cases involve laws that target the poor and homeless. Okay, so that's our basic first case, our basic test. Uh, then we get to uh, a modern example, um, at least, you know, more recent. Uh, Justice Scalia fought uh, several uh, times to have the Supreme Court rule that the Armed Career Criminal Act's residual clause, and I'll define that in a second, was unconstitutional. And it's kind of an amazing history here in that the Supreme Court hears multiple cases and a fairly narrow window, each time Justice Scalia says, this statute's unconstitutionally vague, this statute's unconstitutionally vague. And he loses, and he loses, and he loses, and then he wins. Finally, he convinces the rest of the court to go along. This is one of the reasons why Justice Alito is so upset in his dissent. He's like, we've already settled this issue, right? They, we went over it several times, and you guys weren't really troubled by the vagueness. What is different now? Uh, but this is also happening in lower federal courts all across the country. This statute is creating major problems in application, and I think that sort of creates a cumulative um, sort of uh, feeling among the justices that this is not going away, this is a problem, and maybe vagueness is the way to solve it, um, And whereas they weren't convinced from the get-go. So what is what do we call, what what is this residual clause? Well, what, another way to think of a residual clause is just sort of a catch-all clause. It's you know when you have sort of a disjunctive me and or or a conjunctive me and and phrase, uh, oftentimes at the end you'll include a phrase, particularly with disjunctive clauses, that are just like and anything else that's kind of like this, right? And uh, our our M Armed Career Criminal Act you know, clause here for defining what is a violent felony, which would then lead to a significant sentencing enhancement, um, you know, has some very clear parts, and then it, the residual clause, which is the more controversial. So it's, it's excerpted in the opinion here. Um, it definitely includes any crime that has an element, the use, attempted use, or threatened use of physical force um, against a person or another, but then it's the sub two part that gets complicated is burglary, arson, or extortion, involves use of explosives, or otherwise involves conduct that presents a serious potential risk of physical injury to another. And it's that otherwise involves conduct clause. That's called our, that's our residual clause. It's meant to cover the residual conduct that's not specifically defined in previous um, words or phrases. So is that vague? 
Um, we know that the defendant in this case has committed some very serious offenses, and Justice Alito reminds us of that in the dissent, even expanding upon that. But that's not really relevant to our discussion of whether the statute is vague because we're not discussing whether he committed the underlying crimes. We're discussing whether or not uh, his prior crimes uh, fit this clause, the residual clause, of otherwise involves conduct that presents a potential serious risk of physical injury to another. And at this time, lower courts are all over the map in what should be included or in not included in this. So to give you examples beyond this, and some of these are mentioned in Justice Scalia's majority opinion, but I think it's worth reiterating some of them. Drunk driving is a, a complicated one for many jurisdictions, right? There's nothing that we normally associate with violent felony, right? Because that's sort of our, our language at the top, but it's being defined here um, about drunk driving. It does seem to involve a potential risk, but is that potential risk serious? In fact, most drunk drivers get home. Right? It's only in the aggregate that it becomes a major social concern and problem because drunk driving has caused um, many, many thousands or hundreds of thousands of deaths in the United States. But on a given moment, at a given time, especially lower intoxication levels, is that risk si significant enough to uh, be a serious one? Well, as I said, some lower courts weren't sure quite what to do it, although they generally are like, yeah, that's that's probably going to be a uh, meet the definition of the residual clause. But then we get into the, the problem that certain categories of crimes or certain statutes are defined in a way where some of the conduct might be violent, but some of it might not be, and how to deal with that issue. So one example of this is... Um, when we get to car theft crimes. The lowest degree is sometimes called something like illegal tampering, right? In other words, uh, you are um, accessing a car that is not yours, you're manipulating it in some ways, you're trying to pick the locks is a frequent thing. Um, that is that crime of trying to pick a lock, a violent felony that causes a serious potential risk of physical injury? Not really at the moment you're picking the locks. Car theft in general though, is because it includes you know carjacking when you put a gun in somebody's head and ask them to get out and of course there's the flight uh, from a car um, theft that can also be dangerous if if you are stealing a car in a you know highly trafficked area uh, there might be a chase there could be um, all sorts of uh, casualty potential there uh, but if you are just picking the lock in a car at night in a very secluded area where you have sight lines all around you, the odds of a violent injury are very little. So the court was you know, torn in some of these cases. Should we follow a categorical approach which looks at the entirety of all car thefts, say in that example, or should we look at the specific facts here? And the court opted from an efficiency perspective and from a, a consistency perspective to use this categorical approach. But that also then creates you know, some seeming inequities in the law and perhaps raise concerns in the policy perspective background here about the application of this law. And so you know, what is or is not a, a crime that creates a risk of physical injury is a mess at this point. Um, when I was clerking, one of the cases that went through our circuit dealt with prison escape, right? Prison escape sounds like oh, that's, that's a dangerous crime, right? You've seen all the movies. You've seen prison breaks. But the most common way that people escape from custody, which is, you know, prison, is actually what we call walkaway escape. Usually they're out in a furlough or they're on some form of supervisor's release, and they simply walk away. And in those cases, there's actually very little risk of violence. And yet the courts were like, yeah, overall, we're going to say that this crime as a category um, is a, a serious potential risk. But, the, you know, there was disagreements here. And so I think after all these years and multiple cases, the reason Justice Scalia is eventually able to win over the court is he associates this problem with the vague language. It, it begat all these problems, right? And you can see the rest of it is actually pretty clear, right? Burglary, arson, extortion, explosives. But there's also something else vague that I don't think the court does as good a job here um, handling as maybe they should, which is residual clauses are often associated with two different patterns of interpretation. And so I want you to have these now, and we're going to revisit them in our next section when we get to the McBoyle case, because it turns out residual clauses are somewhat common in criminal law. Um, one way we can look at it, and the way that lots of courts do, is probably 
you know, feels different to sort of lay English speakers. And since, you know, you're new law students, you, you might find this strange, which is to figure out what the meaning of a residual clause is. One way to do it is to look at all the things that are specifically listed and find a common thread among them. In other words, what is common about burglary, arson, extortion, explosives? Oh, wow, that's a crazy list, right? In other words, it's hard to find a thread there. Arson in particular is, you know, a crime that, that, you know, the, mo the most common reason for arson is an insurance scam. Um, so is that different? Extortion usually includes a threat of force, explosives, but it's hard to get a, a clear concept there. The reason I say this may seem unusual is, in fact, the, the pattern that we often have in English is the second way to interpret residual clauses, which is to assume it's things not um, listed previously. In other words, it's things that are different. So you, these, why? Well, it's like if you're going to go to the store and you put together a list and you're like, you know, get some, you know, dinner, maybe get like a steak and get some broccoli and, you know, any, any other food that sounds good, right? You know, you probably aren't going to want them to get something that's like steak and broccoli um, because that you might want them to go with it, but not, you wouldn't look for a common thread among them. The way we use these sort of lists of residual clauses in lay English is to assume that the residual clause is different from the other two. Both of these are uh, interpretive methods that courts use. So residual clauses are tricky because you have two methods that actually point in very different directions. Um, but this adds to the vagueness, right? Because the list is so haphazardly constructed or seemingly haphazardly constructed, it makes it difficult. Um, and so ultimately here, Justice Scalia says, and, and he gets a majority of the court to sign on to say, no, this is, this is absolutely not acceptable. And so the residual clause is struck from the statute. Now, this does give Congress the opportunity, just like the city of Jacksonville is given the opportunity, to go back to the drawing board, right? They can develop language that uh, meets the constitutional test for vagueness, either because now it is linguistically clear or it's not designed in a way that raise concerns about discriminatory or arbitrary enforcement. Um, so this is, as I said, sort of the modern view of it here. Um, and, you know, Justice Alito was, was not happy with this. Justice Alito is perhaps the, the justice in the modern court. I won't say perhaps. He is the most friendly to the prosecution and criminal cases. And he's pretty aghast. Um, I've, I've reduced the opinion a lot. But he's frustrated here because... He thinks it, at worst here, uh, you follow what we call the constitutional avoidance doctrine, which means you interpret the statute in a way that avoids constitutional problems. And he thinks you can do that by following this sort of categorical approach. And at least with this defendant, he doesn't think there's any application problems. So maybe we shouldn't strike it down as a statute, and instead we should just say as applied here, even though he's not willing to even concede that. And I think these are all good points, but Johnson is a tough and controversial case, and it shows how you know legislatures really need to and should pay more attention to the drafting of criminal statutes. They often do it without as much debate, without much thought, and the use of residual clauses often typifies that, right? The idea is... Well, we, we don't want to think through all the crimes that could exist in all the states or whatever. So let's just throw something in that captures the gist of what we're looking for. And you can still do that. But Johnson at least sends a signal that says, well, make sure you make it easier to interpret. Make sure you give us guiding language and not a clause that's so vague that it raises the risk of arbitrary and discriminatory enforcement. And it doesn't give fair warning for people and their ability to comply. Okay, so those are our two cases that sort of define uh, the law as it's understood here. Throughout the semester, I use application exercises, um, these review exercises that are peppered throughout the book, and they're all film clips that are hyperlinked. And these film clips are drawn, you know, to be at most two minutes, but usually under one minute. And they present a, the, the a fact pattern that allows us to extend or apply the doctrine that we've already looked at. Now, the first one we look at here is from the movie Pleasantville, and it is um, uh, unusual uh, because this is one where they actually have a literal statute in the movie clip. That is a rarity. Usually, we even if there are laws in play, uh, they're not read out loud as part of the movie. Uh, but these review exercises we're going to uh, show and discuss in class, so you should watch them ahead of time. I will reshow them in class, and we will then go through applying the statute. But I at least wanted to flag uh, this one for you since it's our first, and to let you know how to proceed 
uh, further. So that's it for our constitutional vagueness doctrine. Next time, we'll get into the not vague statutes, the ones that are merely ambiguous. And then we add more tools to our toolbox, right? So I've already mentioned the basics of how to deal with residual clauses, but we have other rules, right? We have legislative intent, plain meaning, and other concepts that are important. So that's it for today. See you all next time.